What time is it, everybody? It's snake time! time. <laughs> What's up, guys? My name is Dylan Perrin. I am the host of the Animals at Home podcast. That is the podcast that inspires others to push the limits of their reptile husbandry by promoting the importance of high-level, creative care, individualized for each animal. So I'm mainly a keeper. I have six animals behind me. As far as the animals go, I have two geckos and four snakes. I have a crested gecko, a giant day gecko, two boa imperators, a Brazilian rainbow boa, and a jungle carpet python. I live in Manitoba, Canada, and I do all of my work right out of my own apartment. I don't have a fancy studio or fancy facility I get to go to. Everything is done in this room, which is the spare bedroom in my apartment. And an interesting fact about Manitoba is in the summer, we deal with plus 30 degrees Celsius, and in the winter, we deal with minus 30 degrees Celsius. So we have this massive temperature swing, which is, if you are a reptile keeper, which I'm sure you are, is an added challenge when it comes to maintaining humidities and temperatures and everything else when it comes to keeping and raising reptiles. Okay, so my journey in the reptile hobby actually started in 2007 in a Safeway of all places. So if you're not familiar with what Safeway is, it's a grocery store. I was in Safeway in the checkout line and surrounded by all those impulse purchases. Now in the impulse purchase section in the store, there were a bunch of little Venus fly traps. And for some reason, I just had to buy one. So I bought the, uh, the plant, I took it home, and I started Googling how to take care of it and how to, you know, how to raise one of these plants. I quickly learned that due to my dry conditions of where I live, like I said, it's very cold in the winter time, I needed to build a some sort of terrarium to maintain the humidity. So as I'm Googling how to build a terrarium, I find a website that says once you have your terrarium set up and you have all the plants planted, you might consider adding a small live animal like a frog or a gecko. And Basically, fast forward six months from there, I had a crested gecko and a dead Venus flytrap. So my Venus flytrap, I didn't even look at it after I decided I wanted a reptile. I went right to the reptile world and forgot about the plant. And I still have that same crested gecko today. It's 15 years later. He's 15 years old. Of course, it's 13 years later from then. I bought him as a two-year-old. He's still doing fantastic. He's uh, one of my favorite animals. And he is how I got started in the reptile hobby. <laughs> I am very much a visual keeper, so I like to pick animals that I like to watch in their enclosures and behave like wild, natural animals. I'm not typically someone to pull out my animals and pass them around and handle them as much, although I do do that. I don't do it very much, and I really only do it with a few of my animals. I don't do it with them all, so I really like watching animals. So I typically pick animals that I just love the sight of. That's why I got the giant day gecko, nice bright green color, or my jungle carpet python, really stark contrast between bright yellows and dark blacks. And I love watching him climb the trees. And so when, when I'm thinking about getting a new animal, it's very much about what picture and what slice of nature do I want to add to my reptile room? If I want a, you know, a section of the Malagasy ra rainforest, which maybe you can see my day gecko behind me, do I want that in there? If I do want that in my reptile room, then I'm going to gravitate towards an animal like that. I do really visualize my enclosures as little windows into the natural world, and I pick parts of the natural world that I want to look at every day. My fiance was pretty disturbed when she first met me and learned that I had a gecko. At the time, I only had a crested gecko. So slowly I have warmed up to, or she, she's warmed up to the fact that I am a reptile person. And now she is totally fine with the animals. She is still pretty scared of the snakes, but I would say scared and fascinated. She's held them maybe once in her life, but she's always in here looking at them and, and watching them eat or watching them moving around. And, and same with the geckos. She finds them cute and enjoys them. So at first, she was very much against it pretty much entirely. And over the years, it is, she slowly warmed up. And now I think I'm, I have the you know okay to just expand the collection as large as I want. But no spiders, I've been told. <laughs> My favorite part about the hobby is twofold. The first is I love enclosure design. I love doing research and learning about what these animals 
have in the wild and what their habitats look like and then trying to replicate that and then doing my best to replicate that and hope hoping to see natural behaviors in the enclosures i love that part of the hobby i really really enjoy the creation and the building that comes in when you're building a setup and you're you know adding soils and adding substrates and finding plants and creating climbing objects that is exciting we all know what it's like to be just engrossed in a project where you just completely lose the sense of time because you're just working on something and building something i love that part of the hobby and I would say the second part is the people that I meet. As you know, the people in the reptile hobby are amazing. And I get to talk to them, especially part of the podcast. I get to meet and chat with amazing people all the time. And that is a huge benefit and one of my absolute favorite parts of being involved in the reptile community. I would say one of my least favorite parts of the hobby is the restrictions that it puts on you. And if you have more than a few animals, you know what I'm talking about. As soon as you have five, six, seven animals plus, you really need to start thinking about if you're going to go away for a weekend or go, go away on a trip, you have to spend a lot of time planning about what that's going to look like. Do you have someone to come over and look for your animals? Do you have everything set up where they can last one or two days on their own without anybody visiting? For me, I kind of do both. I have sometimes if I'm gone for a long time, I have people come check up on, on them or or sometimes if I'm only gone for two or three days, they're okay to be left on their own. However, as an animal keeper, that's the worst. I hate leaving my animals uh, when I'm gone on a trip. It always you know, puts a pit in my stomach. So I would say that is the worst part of the hobby, constantly worrying about them and really not having the flexibility to just up and leave whenever you want. It's a tough question to answer because I think I, of course, I enjoy all of my animals and it, each of the animals have you know, something really unique about them that make me really enjoy them. I do gravitate towards my Cresta Gecko Jackson as being my favorite just because he's the first. He's what got me into the hobby. I've had him for 13 years, which is an incredibly long time. So he's seen me through you know, university and all these different you know, major life events that I've gone through, and which is really special. And so hopefully I'm showing a little bit of footage now so you can see what he looks like. I don't really handle him very much, so I'm not going to handle him because it'll freak him out. After 13 years, I, I very, very rarely handle him at all. And I would say as a close second is probably my boa Winston because he's my first snake and he's an awesome animal and I will pull him out right now so you can see. All right, so here's Winston. I'm sure you can't see him great right now, so I'll definitely cut some footage in uh, so you can get a better look at him. But this is a Central American boa. He's actually 50% Colombian and 50% Sonoran Desert boa, and he's awesome. So he's a male. He's five years old, and he's very small. So some people think boas get very large, but if you get a smaller species like a, a Central American boa, they stay quite small, and he's an awesome snake. He's the snake that I pull out when I have someone come over that wants to hold a snake and they've never held one before. He's never struck. He's super nice. He's very inquisitive and he likes to move around and uh yeah he's just an awesome animal and as far as my favorite species go again that's a very tough question but i think i would gravitate towards my boas my boa imperators winston being one of them because they are so easy to handle they when i open the cage door they come right out they're happy to explore they're great feeders i never have any issues feeding them and they're just Again, they're that snake that I pull out when people come over and they want to hold a snake. My jungle carpet python can be a little bit rude sometimes. He's okay when I pull him out, but a lot of times he's, uh, I haven't worked with him enough yet. And uh, my Brazilian rainbow boa really is quite a shy animal and she doesn't love being handled. So I tried to respect that and, and you know, give her her space. But the boas really enjoy coming out. And I just love the way they look. Just really cool patterns, nice bright tail, and very entertaining because they do spend a lot of time climbing throughout the day. So it's fun to watch them. So if I had to pick I would say boa is my favorite species. Well, I just want to thank Matthew for giving me the opportunity to answer these questions. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this little segment. If you are looking for more information on me or Animals at Home, definitely check out my YouTube channel, Animals at Home, or go to animalsathome.ca. You can find information about the podcast. If you're someone who's interested in learning about advancing your care or just listening to experts talk, check out the podcast. This is where I get to talk to people who are way smarter than me, ask, ask them questions, pick their brains. And I've learned so much from having those conversations. And I know the listeners have as well. So if that's something you would fancy, maybe if you are somebody who has a long drive to work and you want to, uh, rather than listen to music, listen to somebody talk about reptiles, then check out the podcast. I would really appreciate it. Thank you, Matthew, for letting me answer those questions again. And uh, hopefully I'll see you guys around online. Well, thank you, Dylan, for uh, being part of the first official snake time. <laughs> Avery is out, as you can see.
I found him because I was searching on how to uh, make a Radian heat panel, and he has a video on that. But then in the comments it said, oh, like, there's better ways or there's something better for the animals now. What I really like about Dylan is he keeps animals the way I think that they really should be. A less number of them that he can really enjoy. Even though I am a little bit more hands-on, I like to hold them. I don't just like to, to look at them playing around. I like to be able to hold them and interact with them. That it's important to at least acknowledge if there's something that we can improve, let's work on it, right? I have now so many animals that I would not be able to give them the type of enclosures and homes and everything that Dylan does, but I'm slowly working at cutting down. I'm going to be giving the uh, adults that I keep bigger homes and set them up differently. And it really can be like a fun, almost obsession where you can learn new things and try things that are even out of your comfort zone. I'm so prissy, so it's like the idea of having dirt in my enclosures even is is hard for me to come around. But if there's a way of doing it and doing it well, why not? I've been really trying to uh, push people towards really thinking about keeping less animals in better conditions. and. Just because they can survive and do well in smaller homes and without UV and all those things, it's fine. But do you want to give your animals something that's just fine or do you want to give them the best? You know, lots of people can live in tiny little homes and lots of people live in homes that are way too big for them. But for me, it's about trying to find kind of like that in between or something reasonable. I'm not saying to go nuts, but be reasonable. And Dylan spent a long time before he got to where he is. It's a nice insight for everyone else. What do you think? What did you find the most interesting? And if you didn't find anything interesting, why don't you just answer this question? Participate. Be part of this, okay? <laughs>